Okay, um, so welcome all. Uh, this is a wonderfully magnetic session. We're going to have a lot of fun with magnetic fields. And if I hear anybody uh, ask a question that says, what about magnetic fields? You clearly weren't listening to most of the talks. <laughs> um, so the first speaker today is Jack Livingston, who's going to tell us about revealing the magnetic field structure of the small Magellanic cloud. Take it away, Jack. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, this work has been primarily researched, and pay respect to the Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance today. Uh, so my first slide, uh, I'd like to talk about why we study magnetic fields. So magnetic fields um, have comparable energies uh, to gases and cosmic rays within galaxies. On large scales, they play an important role in the dynamics of clusters and galaxies. And on small scales, they're important in the star formation and evolution of the interstellar medium. Uh, this figure I have here is a Faraday depth uh, map of a radio galaxy. Um, and as we can see here, it forms quite complex structure with positive and negative pointing magnetic fields. Um, in terms of the theory behind how we measure this, uh, we primarily measure a thing called rotation measure. Um, which is uh, what we get when we have polarised synchrotron emission. Um, mostly we get this from AGN, but you can also get this from diffuse emission uh, coming through something called a Faraday screen. Um, and this uh, rotates the polarised signal, and that's where we get this rotation. Um, the rotation measure relates to both the line of sight thermal electron density, NE, and the magnetic field. Um, and primarily, we expect polarization fractions of the AGN we measure to be about 70 to 75% as a maximum. Uh, the object I'll be talking about today is the small Magellanic Cloud. So the small Magellanic Cloud, the SMC, is a low mass, uh, irregular galaxy that is interacting with the large Magellanic Cloud and the Milky Way. Uh, galaxies like the SMC make up the bulk of galaxies today and also galaxies in the early universe. Um, and our proximity to the SMC makes it perf a perfect target for observation to understand the magnetic fields of the bulk of galaxies within our own universe. Uh, the SMC is somewhere between 60 to 63 kiloparsecs away from us um, and has two major star formation regions, uh, the wing and the bar, shown in the uh, green and orange uh, ellipses. So the bar makes up the majority of the SMC star formation and mass. The wing of the SMC uh, connects the SMC to the Magellanic Bridge running between the LMC and SMC and is dominated primarily by tidal forces. Um, the SMC itself is pretty messy, as you can even see within this diagram provided by James Dempsey from ASCA, um, with an irregular shape and unknown path length. Uh, which has been estimated somewhere between three to eight kiloparsecs away. In terms of what's already been done on the magnetic field um, study of the uh, SMC, uh, so through starlight polarisation, um, we know that the SMC has a magnetic field that may align with the Magellanic Bridge, and through rotation measure analysis done by um, uh, Sue Ann Mao in 2008, um, we know that the SMC has primarily a negative magnetic field or one that's pointed away from us. Um, this was done by measuring uh, 10 sources. Uh, in this case, uh, nine of which were negative and one was zero. Um, the SMC plane of sky field extends into the Magellan Bridge on the order of a few microgauss. Um, and the ordered coherent field uh, measured by RMs within uh, parallel to the plane of sky comes in at about 0.2 microgauss in strength with a random field about 10 times as strong as that at two uh, microgauss. Um, we know that the Magellanic Bridge itself has a magnetic field of about 0.3 microgauss directed away from us, um, which is where we get the idea that there's a connection between the Magellanic uh, Bridge magnetic field and the SMC magnetic field. And in fact, 
there might be a pan Magellanic magnetic field that connects the magnetic fields of the LMC, SMC and the bridge. Uh, in terms of the study that we've done, uh, we looked at 22 fields directed at the SMC. Uh, these fields were chosen um, to have high H1 absorption. So unfortunately, there are some gaps within our coverage, especially between the bar and the wing of the SMC, as you can see here. Uh, this data was taken between 1.4 and 3 gigahertz. And we found 80 polarised sources, the 80 sources here, are marked by the red circles. Um, 71 of these sources um, lie behind the SMC, or at least not included in previous calculations of the um, Milky Way foreground. And in terms of what we see, uh, the two images here are the before and after Milky Way foreground RM subtraction. Um, Primarily, uh, and this is on top of a map of neutral column density from the SMC. Um, we see that 59% of RMs after this foreground subtraction are negative, with a minimum of negative 400 radians per square metre, which is a reasonably strong RM source, um, and a positive maximum of 230 radians per square metre. Um, we see a mean um, of negative 40 radians per square metre and a median of negative 9. Um, and we also see an absolute uh, mean and median of 64 radians per square metre and 27 radians per square metre, which is above the mean that you would expect for a foreground. And so clearly what we're observing here is the RM grid of the SMC. Um, in terms of some notable regions, and in the box here we have a zoom in region of the centre, uh, we notice that there seems to be a strong line of negative sources that run from the centre of the bar towards the wing, um, which points roughly in the direction of the Magellanic Bridge. We also know that there's a lot of sign flipping after foreground subtraction within the centre of the bar. And that kind of sort of sign flipping might indicate um, field reversals within the magnetic field. Um, another interesting point um, is at the south of the bar, and below negative uh, 75 degrees in declination, we notice RMs off the main body of the SMC. Um, and this is outside of a region of about two times 10 to the 20 uh, atoms per centimetre squared, which would mean that we're dealing with RMs measured in regions that have trouble with self-shielding and are unlikely to have huge amounts of electrons. Um, in terms of converting this into magnetic field measurements, uh, we use uh, a method outlined by Jane Kashmir in her uh, recent paper on the Magellanic Bridge, uh, where you use neutral hydrogen and an estimation of the ionisation rate. Uh, we used an estimation of about 20%, and that's using dispersion measure measurements uh, to get that. Um, from that and combining those sources with the previous uh, sources that we didn't have in common with um, Anne's paper in 2008. Um, we again see that negative and positive switching in the centre of the bar, as in the printout box. Uh, we see three interesting regions above um, the bar. Uh, notice the kind of clusters of positive, positive and negative. Um, and we also see our strongest magnetic field measurement um, at the very tip of the wing of the SMC. Um, so this is interesting because we would still expect there to be electrons within this region. And so we're not, uh, we don't have a situation where uh, like down at negative 75 declination where we have to estimate the electrons are really low. Um, so the first one I'd like to talk about um, is the bar flipping. So this is a plot of the stru RM structure function um, for the SMC. So the way we do an RM structure function is they are pairwise differences um, between RMs taken at different size scales. And so we take this from the fifth percentile size scale to the 95th percentile. Um, and what we see is we see primarily a flat structure function. There's a little bit of a bump at the lower end where we have lower um, density of pairs, but we would expect um, if we had found the uh, small scale, uh, uh, the important small scale 
um, in magnetoionic turbulence, we would expect to see this to turn down at some point. And so what this tells us is that as our minimum probe size is 250 parsecs, the important um, size scale in small scale magnetoionic turbulence has to be smaller than 250 parsecs within the SMC. Previously, it's been estimated to be 90 parsecs, which is the same as the LMC. But at, um, at the moment, with our current density of probing, we can't actually measure lower than that. Um, another interesting thing, um, in previous papers of other uh, RN structure functions, sometimes you see um, power on the large scales, and we do not see that power. And what this tells us is the large scale magnetic field of the SMC um, isn't varying spatially on those scales. Uh, the next and the kind of really interesting bit are these three clusters above the bar. So looking at um, the outflows predicted by Naomi's paper in 2018, we see that these three clusters seem to roughly line up with um, cold glass outflows uh, observed. Uh, interestingly, we see the two uh, smaller outflows line up with uh, positive RMs and this large uh, outflow that is much more massive than the other two um, having a negative uh, field orientation. Uh, finally, um, this uh, is the region below the bar. And so we require a fairly strong magnetic field to enhance the magnetic field of this region outside of the H alpha emission because we don't expect there to be a huge amount of electrons out there. Um, and this is supported by previous papers on dwarf galaxies that seem to be able to uh, magnetize their surroundings pretty effectively. Um, in terms of what's next for these sort of projects, uh, we're hoping for more data with something like uh, POSSUM, which will allow us uh, to have a much denser RM grid um, and to probe things like the surroundings of the SMC, whether or not the outflows that we potentially see are indeed connected to the SMC and how far they extend up, as well as probing smaller size scales in the RM structure function. And then finally, seeing if there's this direct connection between the magnetic field of the SMC and the Magellanic Bridge. Yeah, that's my presentation. Thanks, Jack. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come on mind. Uh, so we have a question from Danica Scott. You mentioned that there are some unfortunate gaps in the coverage of the SMC, but there seems to have been a lot of overlap in the fields that were observed. Why is this? Is it because the overlapping regions were higher priority than the missed regions? Uh, so in this case, I think the unfortunate thing, um, and I'll pull up the map here, it's that uh, this data wasn't actually selected for this purpose is the, the end result. So this was, taken for uh, Katie's paper, when was Katie's paper published? 2019. Uh, 2019 on H1 absorption. Um, and so obviously if I got my way, I would have filled in that gap, but unfortunately we didn't do that in the end. Jack could have said it's my fault. But... No, no, I'm not gonna throw you <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Alec Thompson. Uh, is the flatness of your RM structure function driven primarily by magnetic structure or the electron density? or both? So uh, this ties really well into Ahmed uh, Cedar's uh, upcoming talk where he tests the differences between these things. Um, from what we can see when I've tested the magnetic field measurements, um, it also produces quite a flat structure function. So as long as our estimations on the electron uh, density are correct, then it would suggest that most of what's happening is coming from the magnetic field, not from the electrons. And do we have any questions at any of the hubs? Yush? Yeah. Uh, so I think like towards the beginning of the talk, uh, you mentioned you that it? the random field is 10 times stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering why it has been added. What could be the reason for that? Um, I'll repeat the question just in case it isn't. Yeah, uh, so the question was why the random field uh, is typically much, much stronger than the ordered field. Um, we do see this uh, in a lot of low mass galaxies. This is pretty common. Um, and I, I'd imagine 
uh, that it's also a lot to do with the fact that we're dealing with interactions. So primarily when we have interactions between galaxies, they merge magnetic fields, but they're much better at merging the random magnetic field than they are at the ordered field. You can still have that amplification of the ordered field as seen in, I think the antenna galaxies show that, but again, you still have the ratio between the ordered and the random field still going down, essentially, as the random field gets much more amplified by interactions between galaxies. Okay, thanks, Jack. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Jack. Okay, our next speaker <coughs> is also from ANU, uh, Lila Jun. And she's going to be telling us about where is the Faraday rotation towards the Magellanic leading arm. So take it away, Lila. Uh, yes, can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, can we can. Me? Oh, all right, right, yep. Just wanted to check. Hi, um, my name is Lila Zhong. I'd like to talk about magnetized high velocity clouds, especially the Magellanic leading arm. Uh, although we don't really know much about cosmic magnetism, we know that the, ma the magnetic fields are everywhere, but often too weak and hard to detect. And Faraday rotation is one of the ways how we observe cosmic magnetic fields. And Jack has already given a nice introduction to the Faraday rotation. And if I just add my version of the explanation on the rotation measure grid, uh, imagine polarized radiations coming from many different sources in the background. Some travel through magnetized clouds and some don't. So we expect the overall Faraday rotation on and off the clouds to be different. And for this kind of statistical approach, having enough polarized sources in the background is important. And there are publicly available all sky surveys that provide rotation measure catalog. The MVSS catalog covers the northern sky with a source density of about one per square degree. And in the southern hemisphere, we have SPES ADCA catalog with a source density of about 0.2 per square degree. And because of this limited polarized source density, RM grid study was focused on large scale galactic magnetic fields and extended objects like high velocity clouds. So high velocity clouds are H1 clouds moving in a high relative velocity with respect to the galactic rotation. They're part of the multi-phase circumgalactic medium in the galactic halo. And as we are sitting on the galactic disk, uh, our the, frame, the, the observer's frame is rotating with the galaxy and inflowing and outflowing gas that do not follow the rotation appears as high velocity gas. And understanding their properties is important in understanding the evolution of the Milky Way. The amount of gas in the galaxy is decided by the amount of gas inflow, outflow, and the star formation rate. The Milky Way is reported to form stars in about one solar mass per year rate, and still we see plenty of cold gas in the galaxy. That means there should be some sort of gas inflow, and high velocity clouds have been suggested to bring gas to the galaxy. However, clouds moving in high velocity lose a lot of their gas due to the interactions with the surrounding circumgalactic medium. Ram pressure pushes the gas away from the clouds, and Calvin Helmholtz and Rayleigh Taylor instabilities take place across the interface between the moving cloud and the surrounding medium. So, in theory, the disruption time scale of moving clouds is expected to be shorter than their infalling dynamical time scale. Then, how do HVCs survive and deliver gas to the galaxy? Magnetic fields are suggested to provide additional stability, stability to the clouds and uh, polarized observations of the Milky Way and nearby adjoint galaxies have found large scale ordered magnetic field in galactic halos. And as a cloud travels through magnetized medium, it sweeps up the magnetic field, 
the field lines drape around the cloud and this draped configuration can suppress hydrodynamics instabilities and possibly extend the lifetime of the clouds. So if so, how do we confirm that with observations? And so far, three of the observed high velocity complexes are suggest to, suggested to be related with magnetic fields, the Magellanic leading arm, the Smith cloud, and the Magellanic bridge. And this figures the size and the color of circles represent the magnitude and the direction of detected rotation measures. You can see on cloud regions have distinctive RMs compared to the surroundings. So there seems to be something, but it's hard to... Um, sorry, Naomi, are we having a problem? Uh, if not, I'll yeah, just... Your figure hasn't updated from the MHD simulation. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Mm. I'll stop share and share it again, maybe. Yep. Give that a try. Good. Yeah. So yeah, there we found there are three observed high velocity complexes, Magellanic leading arm, Smith cloud, and the Magellanic bridge. And yeah, so I'm showing the rotation measure, uh, measure uh, rotation measure on the clouds here. And yeah, so there seems to be something, but it's hard to tell because of the low RM source density. So to do to understand the, the detailed uh, configuration of the magnetic fields, we need the denser RM grid from deeper polariza polarization observations. So as one of my PhD projects, we decided to focus on the leading arm. Our goal was to increase the RM source density in the region with follow-up observations using ATCA and study the detailed magnetic field structures around the cloud. But it didn't really go as planned, and soon you will see why I am saying this. Uh, the resulting RM grid looks like this, with the RM source density twice higher than the previous study. In this figure, the color of the markers is the RM measurements, and the Magellanic leading arm is shown as the gray shade. If we focus on the region studied by Vector Griffith et al. 2010, the RMs on the cloud is close to zero and negative elsewhere. And before we move on to any analysis with the RM grid we have, we check the H alpha emission map to see what the local ionized structures are like in this field. The most prominent feature structures here are the galactic disk and the gum nebula. But we also notice the structure in the middle that overlaps so closely with the Magellanic leading arm. However, there's no way these two objects are physically related because they're in such different velocity range. And with, with a bit of literature search, we found that this is the Antlia supernova remnant that is first discovered in 2002 but it has been often overlooked because of its high galactic latitude, large angular size, and weak synchrotron emission. And actually, people were not very sure whether it's really a supernova remnant or not. Anyway, we know that the object is there. So the question is, is it a Faraday rotator? The RM measured from a point source is a superposition of any Faraday rotation along the line of sight. So uh, if, if the supernova remnant has its own electrons and magnetic fields, the axis of RM we found does not necessarily mean that the Magellanic leading arm has magnetic fields. Instead, it might be just showing the Faraday rotation at the supernova remnant. And to answer this question, we decided to bring extra information from the galactic diffuse polarized emission, which is different from the point source polarization that I'm showing here. The diffuse polarization emission comes from the large scale galactic interstellar medium. So here is this smooth emission from the galactic ISM. 
And if there is a sharp change in electron or magnetic properties in the foreground, it appears as the polarized canals that look something like this. Whereas objects like Magellanic leading arm does not appear in the diffuse polarization because it is located behind the re emission region and doesn't have much radiation from the background. The polarization intensity map of this region shows rich filamentary depolarized structures. And to make these make, make those filaments stand out even further, we use normalized polarization gradient. Basically, uh, they are the same information, but by taking the spatial gradient makes it easier to trace edges of the filaments. And from the HF emission, we already know that there are galactic disks the gum nebula and the antelier supernova remnant at the center of the region. So now I'm going to zoom in to the eastern and western edges of the supernova remnant. So uh, this is the western edge. And we see this beautiful morphological agreement between H-alpha emission and depolarized canals and at the eastern side as well. So back to this question, is the Antelier supernova remnant a Faraday rotator? Yes, and we can confirm that from the morphological match between the H-alpha filaments and the depolarized canals. So what we learned from the diffuse polarization explains a lot about the features appearing in the RM grid. And if we go back to the region studied by McClure et al. 2010, we can clearly say that this area is severely affected by the Faraday rotation of the Antelia supernova remnant. Assuming that the RM axis is purely due to the remnant, the estimated magnetic field strength is around 5 microgauss, which is close to typical magnetic field strength of the galactic ISM. And from this experiment, we concluded that it is hard to say that the Magellanic leading arm is actually magnetized. And before I wrap up, I'd like to quickly show how powerful future radio telescopes would be with their increased observing power. They will provide much denser RM grid. And for example, here I brought the randomly chosen HVC with its angular size about uh, five square degrees. And the left panel red dots are real NVSS sources identified in this field. And as you can see, there are not many sources on the cloud, so we can't really get any useful information about the cloud. And then the source density increases to say 25 per square degree to, to the right. Uh, now it looks like we have sufficient statistical power to study this object. And these red dots are uh, randomly generated sources with a given density expected from an upcoming polarized survey possum. So yeah, it's a really exciting time to do this kind of studies, but we should always be careful that there are local Faraday rotators that can significantly affect RM, like the Antelier supernova remnant in my case. So if you're planning on doing some research with the RM grid in the future, I would suggest that checking diffuse polarization map is a handy way to identify local Faraday screens. Yeah, I'll leave it there and thanks for listening. Thank you, Lila. Uh, so we have a couple of questions online. Uh, we have a question from Alec Thompson. Great talk, Lila. Question. Can RMs from broadband diffuse emission help us to separate the foreground slash background RMs towards the leading arm? Hmm. Broadband diffuse emission. Yeah, so I just got it. So for this research, I just used the polarization gradient map, but if we like check the Faraday depth, uh, like the strength as a Faraday spectrum, basically, then it might say something about two components along the line of sight or something like that. And that might help, really. Yeah. Good. 
Uh, and we have another question from Jake Clark. Great talk, Lala. What extragalactic sources will you be able to detect? Um, oh, if you're asking me about the extra galactic objects that can be studied by using this RN grid technique, um, there is one study using POSM data recently studying the, the magnetic, uh, the RMs on the uh, galaxy cluster. So that kind of study, that kind of study uh, research is uh, really requires high RM density. So yeah, I would point the galaxy clusters as one of the examples of extra galactic sources. And do we have any questions in any of the hubs? Okay, if not, let's thank Lila again. Great talk. Thank you. And our next speaker is Alec Thompson, who's been asking questions. Uh, Alec, <laughs> are you at the Perth Hub? Good. <laughs> okay, we'll give you a second to connect up. So Alec will be telling us about spice racks, spectra and polarization in cutouts of extragalactic sources from racks. And he'll tell us what that means. I assume it has nothing to do with yummy things that go in food. You could mime your talk also. Okay, just to check, can everyone hear and see us online? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alec Thompson. I'm a postdoc at CSIRO. Although, funnily enough, it wasn't too long ago that I was in Naomi's research group along with Jack and Lila. So it's a bit of a reunion that, um, this afternoon. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the ASCAP observatory team, as well as the Possum collaboration to talk about the, the latest and greatest that's coming up in continuum surveys and full polarization from ASCAP. Um, so I won't belabor the point too much because we've heard um, great introductions from, from Jack and Lila, um, but I just wanted to reiterate the fact that magnetic fields um, permeate throughout the entire universe. So no matter which part of the universe you're interested in, magnetic fields will be hanging around there. Um, and as highlighted so far is that um, observing these magnetic fields is, can be hard because we don't have a direct tracer. And so there are still a number of unsolved problems that remain in terms of cosmic magnetism, starting from their origin through their evolution through cosmic time to their current day structures in both uh, the Milky Way, um, nearby galaxies, star forming galaxies, as well as in things like um, jets of AGN and clusters, as well as in um, dense parts of the universe like pulsars. And, and so we've already heard about how we like to study these magnetic fields. And I'm going to continue the theme of um, focusing on uh, polarized radio emission to study magnetic fields in the universe. And one method we have is by studying um, polarized radiation, particularly from synchrotron. The nice thing about synchrotron radiation is that its intrinsic polarization angle uh, corresponds to the angle of the magnetic field in the plane of the sky. So that lets us study the plane of sky structures from synchrotron emitting regions. And we've also heard a lot about um, Faraday rotation. 
And so I won't belabor that point much more, other than just to highlight where I stole this picture from, from a recent paper by Katia Ferrier, which uh, not only addresses a number of kind of mistakes that have cropped up in the literature recently, but also give a really good overview as an introduction to the field. So if you're getting your head tied up in knots between rotation measures and Faraday depths and which way the integral goes, it's a really great paper to review. Um, I will make the point though, that I'm, uh, we should make the point that rotation measure and Faraday depth uh, do mean different things. So our rotation measure gives us this line of sight integrated quantity, and it's really an, an observational quantity, but it does allow us to get our electron density weighted magnetic field for the magnetic field pointing along the line of sight. The Faraday depth, while similar to the rotation measure, is actually a truly physical quantity and similar to optical depth, and it can actually be defined for every point along our line of sight. Another important thing to note is the way that um, the, sig the way that polarized signals appear when we observe them. And so Faraday rotation is a, is a, goes by a, by a factor of wavelength squared. Um, and so for a simple foreground screen, like Jack was showing before, um, we get a sign-like um, oscillation in our Stokes Q and U parameters, so in our linear polarization. So that's a, a constant turning over of our polarization angle as a function of wavelength squared. However, even in a very simple model, if we get any mixed emission and rotation, we can start to get sync-like depolarization. Um, and things become even more complicated if you have mixed emission and rotation along the line of sight. So the key point here is that to discriminate between these two scenarios, we need observations of many values of wavelength squared. Um, so there's low radio frequencies that give us the most amount of wavelength squared, but conversely, low radio frequencies also tend to be depolarized more. And so really, we're just super greedy for uh, observations of wavelengths. We want as many as we possibly can. Um, and Lila described the experiment that we, we want to do, and that is the rotation measure grid. So we want to use our background um, synchrotron emitting sources like this radio galaxy I'm showing here to probe the foreground material. And of course, we can also um, study the individual sources themselves. Um, but we use this amazing cosmic coincidence that we have strong Faraday rotation at radio frequencies and a bit abundant linearly polariz polarization from synchrotron emitting objects. So to perform this rotation measure grid experiment, as I mentioned, we want broad bandwidth, so as many values of lambda squared as we, wavelength squared as we can possibly get. We want to cover wide areas. So as Lila was showing, some of the features that we want to study cover tens of degrees or even the entire sky in the case of the Milky Way. We also want to have high sensitivity. So we want to bump up the number of polarized sources we can detect per square degree, and that lets, allows us to study smaller angular scales. So we want to go from just being able to study the Milky Way as a whole and probe down to individual galaxies or clusters. And we also want to have high intrinsic angular resolution for when we want to study the actual individual objects like radio galaxies themselves. And so this is where um, survey instruments like ASCAP are making an enormous difference. So today I want to talk about the latest and greatest continuum survey that's come out of ASCAP by the name of the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey or RACS. And it's described in a paper from 2020 by Dave McConnell pictured here. So RACS is an observatory project. So unlike say EMU, Wallaby or, or Possum, um, this project, this survey was carried out by the ASCAP Observatory. And it's an all sky continuum survey so from the sub, covering the South Celestial Pole up to a Northern declination of 40 degrees in um, full polarization. So RACS is constructed from 15 minutes integration, each covering roughly about 30 um, square degrees for each pointing. And so that means you can survey the entire sky in about two weeks. And this is a huge leap over what was um, previously possible, requiring years to match the equivalent survey. So um, RACS has been broken down into three components, um, matching each of the three bands that we can tune ASCAP into. RACS low, centered on 888 megahertz, has now been processed and published. Um, RACS mid, centered on about 1300 megahertz, um, is current, has been observed and is currently being processed now um, by Stefan, who recently joined us at CSIRO, and tests for the high band RACS is now, are now underway. So I want to highlight that um, images and source lists are now publicly available on CASDA. Um, and you can see the remarkable increase in resolution we have here in the panel, um, comparing two previous surveys, large area surveys being SUMS on the top, NVSS down the bottom. 
So right, and this is a rack's low image in the middle, and we achieve on average about 15 um, arc second resolution and an RMS in the noise of about 300 microjanskis per beam. And something that's quite new, um, as of just a couple of weeks ago, um, Rack's Low is now available on Aladdin. So if you want to waste a couple of hours like I did, just looking at pretty radio galaxies, I strongly encourage that. Um, cataloging work has been led by Catherine Hale, uh, who was previously at CSIRO, but now at University of Edinburgh. And we selected a common resolution of 25 arc seconds um, so we, uh, to have uniform across the entire sky. And so that meant we selected about 800 tiles out of the 900 odd or so. And again, uh, with around 300 microjanskis per beam of noise. And so Catherine has cataloged about 2.1 million sources from racks in total intensity, corresponding to about two and a half million um, Gaussian components. And, and for completeness, Catherine has showed us that we're about 95% uh, complete at five millijanskis for point sources and for all sources, including um, extended ones, we're complete to about three millijanskis. So this brings us into spice racks. So I finally get to tell you all what spice racks actually is. It is uh, spectra and polarization and cutouts of extragalactic sources from racks, which has the added benefit of being a quadruple nested acronym. Um, so spice racks is the polarization component of racks. In particular, we're interested in Stokes Q and U um, to go after our linear polarization. So while still remaining part of the observatory project, this is done in collaboration with the Possum Survey team. So the idea is that RACS observations being snapshot are best for, um, uh, for quantifying compact sources. So extended sources are not really what it's ideal for. And so we want to avoid producing the large cube data products that take up a significant amount of disk space and computational time. Instead, we want to do cutouts around the compact the sources we detect in RACS and then process them through a custom pipeline. So the, the primary aim is to produce a shallow all sky RN grid catalog. Um, we estimate that we'll achieve around two to five sources per square degree, cataloging about 10 to the five sources, um, which will make it the largest ever polarization catalog produced so far. So I've been working on developing the pipeline, which is based in Python and Dask. So that allows it to be highly parallelized. So if you're interested in um, um, pipeline work, particularly in natively in Python, um, come and speak to me or message me on Slack. So the idea is that we take our um, calibrated images, cut out the sources of interest, combine them together, so we mosaic them back together to build up our sensitivity, extract our polarization spectra, and then uh, gain out the rotation measure information that way. To start off with, we're taking a bite-sized chunk of the 800 fields or so that Catherine has cataloged and taking 30 of them to process as a proof of concept. So this will be um, 30 of the racks low fields towards the uh, spiker H2 region, and at, which I'm showing here in contours are from H alpha and overlaid in white are the 30 racks fields we propose to process. Um, the nice thing about the spiker H2 region is that it, al it allows to probe in a fairly isolated way the magnetized turbulence, again using RM structure functions like Jack was showing towards the SMC. Um, the nice thing about this H2 region is that it's large and nearby, allowing us to probe to very small physical size scales. Um, and it also is at high galactic latitude, which means we have a fairly pristine line of sight. It's also at an intermediate declination, allowing us for comparison to existing surveys such as NBSS and ATCA um, that Lila was showing before, allowing us to um, cal we'll make sure that our um, calibration processes are correct. Um, and this will really highlight what we're able to do with SpiceRacks observations, in meaning that we'll be able to select only our Faraday simple sources, um, as well as cataloging a huge, a huge area of, of the sky. And just to note, in terms of the physical size scales we can go down to, um, a bump up from um, one source per square degree, which is kind of the state of the art with NVSS, down to about three with spice racks will allow us to probe to about 0.16 parsecs towards the sp um, spike H2 region. So processing is currently underway. Um, at, these, at the frequencies of racks low, we achieve a Faraday resolution of about 50 radians per square meter. So that allows us to have the precision in terms of rotation measure. I'm showing an example spectra of what we can achieve with SpiceRacks showing this lovely sinusoidal um, structure in Q and U. Um, so 
a preliminary source count from the fields I've processed so far, uh, indicating a source count of three per square degree, which is excellent. However, we are still dealing with a primary systematic of wide field leakage. So ASCAP generates uh, 36 beams, which is 36 times what we'd normally get with an um, interferometer. Um, and every single image is imaged in the wide field and then mosaic together. And the further you go out in a wide field image with your interferometer, the stronger your instrumental polarization becomes. Um, so I've also been working inside of the observatory to um, map and correct for this wide field leakage using a holographic based method. So if you're interested in your an interferometric primary beams in full polarization, again, come and speak to me or again, message me on Slack. So I'll just say, say thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Alec. Uh, let me just check for the questions here on Slack. Uh, so we have one question that has answered itself and another question from Jake Clark. Great talk. What's the increase of radio sources thanks to Rax? It seems like that would be an incredible increase of radio sources with the huge improvement of spatial resolution. Uh, so was asking what is the increase in the number of sources? Is that right? Yeah, so we detect yes. for in racks mid, we get on average about 4,000 sources per pointing tile. So each one of those 800 tiles. And in, so in polarization, the, the, I, I think I mentioned the one on the slides before that we're currently getting around three polarized sources detected per square degree. That is still a preliminary number. Um, we're hoping to improve that once we have this wide field leakage correction in place, and that will allow us to nail that down a bit more, because uh, this leakage effect in, uh, induces falsely polarized sources into our images from total intensity. Um, so once we have that, that correction robustly in place, we'll have a more nailed down number in terms of source counts. But the three is in line with the sensitivity and resolution increase we have with racks. And we have another question from Danica Scott. Alec, are there plans for a Python module or similar to allow racks slash, slash spice racks look up within Python? Yes. So the as part of the um, as part of the pipeline, I build a database along the way. Um, and so I'm looking to hopefully make that web-based at some point as well. Uh, the, the data will also be deposited on CASDA for lookup. And so the pipeline itself will also go public with the initial release of the data. Super. Uh, do we have any questions at any of the hubs? Or any other questions on Zoom? Okay, thank you very much, Alec. So our next speaker in this session is Radhika Chirakara. I'm sorry if I terribly did that. Uh, who will be telling us about efficient, highly subsonic, turbulent dynamo and growth of primordial magnetic fields. So I'll let you take it away. We can. We're starting to see your slides. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Well? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Radhika and I'm a first year PhD student at ANU. And today I'm going to talk about uh, magnetic field amplification in the highly subsonic regime and the application of this study to primordial magnetic fields. This work was done in collaboration with Christoph Petrat, Roby Banerjee, and Tanjil Trivedi at ANU and the University of Hamburg. So I'll start with the motivation of our study, which is the lower bound on the intergalactic magnetic field strengths. And these have been inferred from gamma ray observations of tera electron volt blazers. So on the right here is uh, one, a plot from one of the first studies which have uh, estimated the IGMF constraint from uh, TV observations. 
and uh, the black hatched lines here uh, are the magnetic field lower bounds that uh, they find from the Fermi observations. And you see that on megaparsec scales, it does not depend much on the scale, the correlation length of the magnetic field itself, but on lower scale, it does. And other parts on this plot show constraints on the magnetic fields from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, Faraday rotation, uh, and isotropies in the cosmic microwave background, and so on. So, uh, many studies have looked into the origin of these uh, magnetic fields and there's been a debate about whether these fields are from astrophysical processes or are they remnants from the early universe. And studies that have looked at this uh, cosmological origin of these fields have found that the seed magnetic fields, which can be produced uh, during phase transitions in the early universe or inflation or so on, are not strong enough to explain the lower bounds found from these Fermi observations. So to bridge this gap between uh, observations and uh, the theory in 2014, Vaxta Fatal proposed that it is possible that a small scale turbulent dynamo in the early universe might have amplified the seed magnetic fields already present in the early universe and the field strengths generated by this dynamo can be comparable to the observations. Ouch, okay. So uh, the turbulent dynamo is a mechanism that efficiently amplifies magnetic fields by converting turbulent fluid motions on small scales into magnetic energy. But to say that this happened in the early universe, we must look at if the primordial plasma was turbulent or not. Um, so uh, the study finds that Turbulence is generated in the early universe by gravitational acceleration of the primordial fluid due to primordial density fluctuations. And if first order phase transitions happen in the early universe, that can also inject turbulence in the primordial plasma. And this primarily generates longitudinal velocity fluctuations and this Dynamo is expected to have operated under very subsonic conditions. So with a Mach number of 10 to the minus four or so. And all previous studies of the turbulent dynamo have explored this process in the transonic or supersonic regime. So in our work, we extend the turbulent dynamo study to the highly subsonic regime and then um, see what we can say about the turbulent dynamo action in the early universe. So we solve the following 3D MHT equations, the continuity equations, the Navier-Stokes equation, and the induction equation. And we inject kinetic energy into our simulation through this acceleration field, which drives the turbulence for us. And we do so on scales of the box. Uh, and the eddy turnover time, which is the important time scale for the turbulence, is defined by L by 2V. So this is just the eddy turnover time at our forcing scale in our simulations. And yeah, uh, so the turbulent dynamo from our simulations, we find that uh, amplifies magnetic field exponentially and the dynamo amplification depends on two parameters, the solenoidal fraction in the acceleration field and the Mach number of our simulations. So the Mach number uh, is just the velocity fluctuation divided by the sound speed and um, the solenoidal fraction is a value between zero and one. And zero means that we are only injecting completely longitudinal velocity fluctuations in our simulations. And um, uh, zeta one is that we are only introducing uh, rotational 
velocity fluctuations in our simulations. And this is a slice plot from of the magnetic energy from our simulations. And we see that um, at saturation, the magnetic energy depends upon the value of zeta and the Mach number as well. So I'll move on to the results now. So here I have the Mach number, the magnetic energy normalized to the initial magnetic energy and the magnetic energy divided by the kinetic energy as a function of time divided to the forcing eddy turnover time scale. And uh, in the middle panel here, you see uh, that the exponential amplification of magnetic fields by the small scale turbulent dynamo. And uh, on the bottom panel, you see that the ratio of the magnetic energy to the kinetic energy follows a similar pattern and it saturates. And uh, this is what we call the saturation efficiency of the dynamo. It just tells you how well the, mag the dynamo mechanism is converting the turbulent kinetic energy into the magnetic energy. And this is the main parameter we are interested in, in our study. And another thing to note from this plot is that at a higher value of zeta, the dynamo action and the growth of magnetic fields are faster and the saturation efficiency is also higher. So this is the summary plot from uh, our study and uh, this shows the saturation efficiency of the dynamo and the kinetic energy in rotational velocity modes divided by the total kinetic energy of the system as a function of Mach number. So you see that uh, we have now from 10 to the minus 3 to Mach number of 20 including this earlier study. So the blue points here are results from the earlier study by Fedrat et al in 2011. And different colors on this plot show different solenoidal fractions that we have used in our simulations. So uh, we see that uh, the ratio of kinetic energy in rotational modes to the total is the critical property for the turbulent dynamo action. And in the highly subsonic regime, this value increases, leading to an increase in the saturation efficiency and even the growth of the turbulent dynamo. And um, we see that for all our dynamo models that we have studied, uh, we find the same. So the turbulent dynamo is efficient in the highly subsonic regime is the main takeaway from this plot. Now uh, we want to link this back to the uh, intergalactic magnetic field strengths from the first slide. And we do so by looking at the purely compressive uh, turbulent dynamo model because in this simulation, we only inject longitudinal velocity fluctuations. So, um, and we do this by taking the value of the saturation efficiency at the lowest Mach number simulation that we have performed. So um, when the turbulent dynamo is, if the turbulent dynamo is driven only by primordial density fluctuations, uh, from our study, we predict that magnetic field strengths, uh, present day magnetic field strengths greater than 10 to the six, minus 16 cars can be gen generated or amplified by the turbulent dynamo on scales of 0.1 parsecs. And if a first order phase transition occurs in the early universe, uh, the turbulent dynamo driven by such a mechanism can generate a much higher field strength of 10 to the minus 13 cos on scale of 100 parsec. And um, we go back and compare what we have here to the uh, Fermi observations of TeV blazars. And um, we find that these field strengths are compatible with the present day IGMF inferred from gamma ray observations on scales of 0.1 parsec and 100 parsec. And um, here I should say that the values that we uh, predict from our study are lower limits because we don't quite reach the early universe Mach number of 
10 to the minus 4 and it's likely that the magnetic field amplified by such a dynamo mechanism indeed had greater saturation efficiency in the early universe so you would expect a stronger magnetic field on both these scales so i will leave you with the summary of my talk which is um, we study the turbulent dynamo model for a broad range of Mach numbers and uh, together with the earlier studies of the dynamo we now have the properties of the dynamo in the highly subsonic transonic and the supersonic regime and we also explore the properties of the dynamo for five different forcing models we find that for all the turbulent driving models that we have studied. The turbulent dynamo is efficient in the highly subsonic regime. The saturation efficiency of the dynamo increases uh, as the Mach number decreases in this regime. And um, it is the same with the growth rate of the dynamo as well. And using the results from the study by Bachstaff et al, uh, we predict the lower bounds on the magnetic fields generated by the turbulent small scale dynamo acting in the early universe uh, using our purely compressively driven turbulent dynamo model at a Mach number of 10 to the minus 3. And uh, we look at the Fermi observations of the lower bounds that they predict for the IGMF and find that uh, our results are compatible to these observations on scales of 0.1 and 100 parsec. And you can read more about uh, our work on this paper here. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, we have a question on Slack uh, from Shyam Manon. Why did earlier simulations not probe the subsonic regime if that is the expected physical condition of the early universe? Is it a numerical difficulty? Yeah, so uh, it, it is a numerical difficulty to explore the highly subsonic regime because uh, the time step in these codes are determined by the sound speed and in the highly subsonic regime, by definition, the sound speeds are much higher than the velocity fluctuation. So yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Ah, yeah, Raj. Uh, Hang on. Another Hang question. On. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Try again. Okay. Yeah, so my question is, you showed the energy ratios, right, of solid order to total energy, or there was also magnetic to total energy saturation ratios. And you yes. have some dashed lines there, so are they uh, some functional form? The yeah, they lines? just uh, fit to the eye, so um, <laughs> they're just some polynomial I fit, and we know that the saturation efficiencies cannot exceed one, so you just take the data we have and constrain that. Uh, and so it's just a fit to I. Do we have any questions at any of the other hubs? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Radhika again. Thank you. And our next speaker, continuing a certain ANU theme, <laughs> is uh, Amit Sita, who will be telling us about magnetic filaments in the ISM due to the small-scale dynamo. Is it? I think it's showing up. Yep. Yep, it's all yours. Yeah. Thank you, Naomi. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Amit. We'll be talking to, to, uh, today about magnetic filaments in the ISM due to small scale dynamo. This work is done with Christoph Edrath and Paul Anwar and Toby at Newcastle uh, University. I would also like to thank organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. So uh, very 
very uh, small introduction about uh, magnetic fields in the ism so the interstellar medium of galaxies is a very dynamic uh, media it consists of thermal gas cosmic rays magnetic fields dust and all of this in some way or other keep talking to each other the ism is also turbulent and multiphase so the turbulence is driven at least on larger scale by supernova explosion which have this driving scale of around 100 parsec and this turbulence uh, the kinetic energy of turbulence is also converted to magnetic energy by a dynamo mechanism as was discussed uh, by radhika in the previous talk uh, and the this magnetic field in the ism is observationally traced by a variety of tracers some of which i have listed here and from observations we know that the magnetic fields have typical strengths of around 5 to 10 microgauss they can be divided into two categories the small scale random and large scale mean field where small scale random refers to the magnetic field with driving uh, with correlation less than the driving scale of turbulence and the large scale fields have driving scale uh, sorry correlation less much larger than the driving scale of turbulence and it turns out that the energy densities of all these components i was talking of is uh, average energy density is comparable and thus magnetic field forms an important component of ism of, sp of spiral galaxies and question i think i ask sometimes myself also that why should we study ism magnetic fields besides being interesting in its own right as the group here the uh, the list of speakers surely believes it also is very important in various uh, physical processes in the ism whether it's regulation of star formation in dynamics launching of galactic winds etc but today i am focusing more on uh, the magnetic fields in the ism and the dynamic mechanism which generates it so a very one slide introduction of small scale dynamos so dynamo is basically a mechanism with, by which kinetic energy of turbulence is converted to magnetic energy this is uh, a small textbook thing so for a for a non relativistic plasma if you take ampere's law and Uh, uh, put it in ohm's law with a constant eta you would end up with this equation which is the induction equation which is basically telling you how magnetic field evolves in time so this is the left hand side is the evolution of magnetic field and the right hand side has two terms one of them is the induction or amplification term and diffusion term it's more like like profit and loss credit and debit so if, if and the turbulent velocity which i was talking of the turbulent kinetic energy goes here so if u is zero there is no turbulence then one would not have a dynamo and if eta which is the resistivity or dk rate dk parameter is zero then you will have pure amplification and it turns out that uh, the as observationally the field is divided into large and small scale even the dynamo theory is divided into large and small scale i am mostly talking of the small scale dynamo here and the small scale dynamo is due to random stretching of magnetic field lines by turbulent velocity physically it is due to random stretching of field lines by turbulent velocity and uh, it it only works if this parameter magnetic reynolds number is above some critical value and it turns out that the small scale field is spatially intermittent and often filamentary so basic uh, so the focus of my talk is to understand the filaments formed by small scale dynamo to show you an uh, uh, image what i have shown here is uh, a galaxy m51 with where the background image image in both of them uh, both of this left and right panels is from hst and this drapery pattern you see on top of it is due to fir polarization on the left hand side and due to radio polarization on the right hand side so when i was talking about large scale field basically i meant this large scale field uh, which is shown here uh, which goes along with the spiral of the galaxy and uh, the small scale dynamo is happening at a much smaller scale uh, and you see the properties of uh, this drapery pattern in the fir polarization is very different from radio polarization at least at smaller scales so if so fir which probes more of a cold dense medium than radio which probably pour, uh, probes more of hot diffuse medium says that in both places the magnetic field structure is different in the dense and hot phase this is in like an observational uh, mm, uh proof of the fact that as you change the phase of the medium 
you will have slightly different magnetic fields even on this scales if you go even further the difference of course amplifies a bit more so what we do is we look at uh, this problem from point of view of numerical simulations so what i'm talking here about is small scale dynamo simulation basically we solve an uh, for an isothermal gas we solve continuity induction and navier stokes equation for a bunch of parameters characterizing the viscosity resistivity and the compressibility of the flow so reynolds or uh, magnetic reynolds number and mach number and uh, uh, this is done using both i did this both using the pencil code and the flash code uh, and the driving controls what uh, compressibility you can put in you have if the mach number is very low it's a subsonic driving it's more a proxy for hot phase of the ism and as mach number increases you uh, you tend to probe more of cold or denser phases of the ism so basic, there are a lot of equations here but basically what you are what we are trying to do in a periodic num three dimensional numerical box we are driving turbulence with some very weak seed field and look how this field evolves so this is the plot of evolution for all four mach numbers 0.125 and 10 we start with a very low magnetic field this is magnetic field ratio of magnetic field to kinetic energy and then you see an exponential amplification of this magnetic fields this happens for all the mach numbers of course at a different rate eventually the magnetic field becomes strong enough to react back on the flow and that saturates the dynamo so you can only go so much using this dynamo mechanism but the take home message here is that dynamo is active in all mach numbers so though it is less efficient at higher mach numbers so probably one should expect uh, uh, the small scale dynamo to be active in all the phases and it will be less efficient in the colder denser phase and if you visually see at fields i have showing it at uh, two mark numbers here for some different time snapshot you always see this filamentary structure usually the magnetic fields generated by small scale dynamo are filamentary even for very low mark numbers 0.1 and if, if if you look at this if you look at much higher magnetic energy this is normalized to the box at much higher magnetic energy then also you see this filamentary structures it have like snakes in my numerical box and the question is what is the size and shape of this magnetic structures the motivation for doing this is to properly compare the structures you see here with the structures you see in observation or in other simulations to show this in this slide i'm showing variety of filaments or snakes uh, whether it on the left hand side you have all the simulations these are different kinds of simulation this is with cosmic rays these are star forming simulation these are msg turbulence simulation uh, these are some very old simulations where also they saw filamentary structures so there are a lot of filaments seen in simulations and this side is observations so there are various again observation with herschel radio observation rotation measure observations as was discussed in some of the previous talks plank data you see snakes everywhere some of the people uh, like here have snakes in observations and theory both so this are like this is nothing the this filamentary structure is very generic and she, seen in various simulation observation and it's important to characterize it so the thing we use is the technique of minkowski functional which was the technique used by cosmologists to characterize the large scale structure of the universe and the basic idea is using this technique you get length width and thickness of the structures so suppose if you have a sphere the length width and uh, thickness will roughly be equal to the radius and if you have a pancake it differs you can one can con construct quantities quantities like planarity and filamentarity from these numbers which are non dimensional numbers to characterize the shape of the structure so for example a sphere would have very low planarity and filamentarity a pancake would have a very high uh, planarity but low filamentarity and if you have a filament that will have very high filamentarity but low planarity so this is just a technique to characterize the shape of the structure when we apply it to our small scale dynamo simulation at mach number 0.1 we find that the length is independent of the resistivity this has some important consequences from dyna for dynamo theory and width and thickness goes as rm to the power minus half however we we'll always see that the f the filamentarity is much greater than planarity so we do confirm that this the visually what we see as filaments are really filaments and all of the structures uh, increase in size as magnetic field becomes stronger and as rm increases 
both planarity and filamentarity tends to try, it looks like it tends to a constant value. So basically to sum up, I have talked that small scale dynamo is active at all Mach numbers. So one should expect it in all the phases of the ISM. The small scale dynamo generated magnetic fields are filamentary at all Mach numbers. And we studied the morphology of this magnetic structures at a low Mach number now. And I've shown that it is really eight times more filamentary than its planar. And the basic idea of this work is to try and compare now this with observations, as I was showing you in one of the slides, and other simulation to constrain some of the physical parameters of interest. What I, whatever I've talked here is mostly in the bold references, bold reference, but I've also taken some plots and ideas from other references. Happy to chat about it. Uh, over email or questions now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Amit. Uh, we have a question from Piyush. Would you like to just ask it? Yeah, I was just wondering. So, like, if you take the warm phase of the ISM, like 10 to the power 4 Kelvin gas, like H2 regions and so on, uh, what could possibly drive a small scale dynamo in the lab? Basically, anything which drives turbulence. Like if there is turbulence and there is some magnetic field, then it can drive a small scale dynamo. Yeah, if the magnetic field is weak, even subsonic. So basically, where so the job of small scale dynamo is to convert the kinetic energy of turbulence to magnetic field. So if there is turbulence and there is weak magnetic field, I must say, if it's very strong, then it becomes more of an MSD turbulence because you excite waves. If there is weak magnetic field and turbulence, you will generate. Uh, magnetic fields that will amplify by a small scale band. Are there any other questions at any of the hubs or any of the online participants? Okay, thank you very much. You. Crystal clear. Our final speaker in this session, just in case you thought it didn't have anything to do with ANU, does. Uh, so it's Jackie Ma, who is on Zoom, connecting from Bonn, Germany. And Jackie is going to be telling us about a gas cap view of H1 filaments in the SMC, the relationship with magnetic fields. So Jackie, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Naomi. And hello everyone, my name is Jackie Ma and I'm a postdoc at CNU. And today I will show you the results from our ongoing study of the alignment of H1 filaments with magnetic fields in the small Magellanic cloud. So from, uh, from the talks earlier today, we've learned how we can use synchrotron emission and also rotation measure to trace magnetic fields. And here I will uh, introduce yet another way that we can use to measure magnetic fields in the interstellar medium. So as many of you may know, starlight is in general intrinsically unpolarized. And as the starlight traverses through the interstellar medium towards us, it may encounter some dust particles along its way. And very often these uh, dust particles are not uh, spherically symmetric, but rather have an elongated morphology, which causes them to align their short axis with the magnetic field direction uh, due to the radiative torque alignment mechanism. And the result of this alignment is that uh, these dust grains will have a stronger extension effect to the starlight that is uh, that's oscillating orthogonal to the magnetic field direction. And this induces a linear polarization signal that we can observe from the starlight that is along the magnetic field uh, orientation. So in summary, we can just observe the linear polarization angle of these starlights uh, and it will tell us about the magnetic field direction in the intervening interstellar medium. And this effect has been combined with uh, GALF H1 data by Susan Clark and co-authors to study nearby H1 filaments in the Milky Way. And what they found is that these H1 filaments are aligned with magnetic fields traced by starlight polarization. This could imply that magnetic fields is playing an important role in the formation of these H1 structures. Furthermore, they have found that the, this degree of alignment is dependent on the physical resolution of the observations, since by repeating their analysis on the lower resolution gas H1 data, they have found that the alignment of the filaments with the magnetic field is much uh, less obvious. 
The question we have then is, can we see a similar relationship of uh, H1 filaments with magnetic fields in other galaxies than our own? For our case, we have uh, decided to focus on the Small Magellanic Cloud, or the SMC. This is mainly because of its uh, proximity to us, which will give us a reasonable physical resolution to study the, uh, these H1 filaments. And indeed, from the new gas cap H1 image, as I showed here, we can see that the, the SMC exhibits a vast network of H1 filaments across the entire galaxy. And also, there's already a recently published Starlight Prizing catalog of the SMC, which, of course, is very useful for our study. And finally, of course, we also want to see if uh, the uh, relationship of H1 filaments with magnetic field in the Milky Way still holds in a galaxy with a very different astrophysical conditions, including metallicity, star formation rate, and also one that is uh, experiencing a significant tidal force. We have used new H1 data from the gas cap survey, which is taken using the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. This is an H1 and OH survey of both the galactic plane and the Magellanic system, as shown in the figure uh, in the lower right corner. The survey will uh, give us an unprecedented combination of sensitivity, angular resolution, and also velocity resolution in the surveyed area. And some of you may have already seen how impressive the data is from Katie's talk uh, yesterday in the morning. And indeed, the exquisite quality of the data has actually enabled our study here because we are focusing on the intricate filamentary structures in the SMC. The survey itself is currently in the pilot phase, and we expect that it will move on to the full survey mode later this year. So with the H1 cube in hand, as shown in the uh, upper panel here, we have applied the rolling huge transform or the RHT algorithm to this uh, H1 cube. This is an automatic filament finding algorithm that gives us as outputs uh, an array of H1 filaments map across velocity as shown in the bottom row. On the other hand, for the Starlight Prizing data, we have used the recently published Lobo Gomez Starlight Prizing catalog of the SMC. Of the many uh, covered fields, 19 of them are covered by our new gas cap observations, and each of them have a field of view of about eight arc minutes across, and a star count ranging from 40 all the way up to about 700 stars. And on average, there are about 300 polarized stars per field. In particular, uh, their regions uh, 1 to 10 correspond to the main body or the bar region of the SMC, while fields 11 to 19 correspond to the tidal feature or the wing region. And finally, their reported starlight uh, pricing data is already Milky Way foreground subtracted, which means the reported starlight pricing signal reflects the physical conditions in the SMC only. And now with the two sets of data in hand, we have proceeded, we have proceeded to perform a careful comparison between them. And to do this, we have uh, developed a new ray tracing technique to of starlight through our uh, new gas cap H1 cube. What we've done is that we have placed stars at the exact positions as reported by the starlight processing catalog and allowed the starlight to pass through our entire H1 cube. And whenever the starlight is intercepted by an H1 filament, we will add linear pricing signals uh, accordingly to the starlight, with the pricing angle being aligned with the H1 filament orientation. The output that we will get is then the expected starlight pricing signal of each of the stars, assuming that the H1 filaments indeed follow the magnetic fields there. So from this, uh, star, uh, from this ray tracing experiment, an obvious limitation is that we are assuming that all of the SMC stars are physically behind all of the SMC H1 gas, which of course we would expect it to be not the case because we would expect the two components to be kind of situated in the same volume mixed in together. And to remove this uh, limitation, we have uh, repeated our ray tracing experiments, but this time we have placed the stars within our H1 cube. So for many of the um, starlight fields, the, if we look into the H1 uh, profile, as I show on the right as an example for one of the fields, 
uh, they can be represented by two H1 components. So what we have done is then we have placed the stars between the two components instead and allow and pass the starlights through each of these H1 components individually. So here I'm showing the illustration of uh, passing the starlights through the lower velocity components to, towards our telescope. And also, of course, we have repeated the same thing, but this time uh, passing through the higher uh, velocity components instead. So for the first case, when we pass the starlights through the lower velocity components, we are implying that the lower velocity H1 components is physically closer to us than the higher velocity components and also vice versa. So now with the um, ray traced uh, starlight linear polarization in hand, we have proceeded to compare with the actually observed values reported in the starlight polarization catalog. What we have done is to compute the average starlight polarization angle for each of the fields for the three ray tracing cases and calculated the angle difference between the ray traced and the actual starlight. And the angle differences are listed in these two extensive tables here, but please don't be intimidated because uh, I've highlighted the cases where the two are matching within 20 degrees as uh, the green cells. And uh, we can see uh, that for the lower H1 velocity components at in the uh, main body of the SMC, we can see a pretty good agreement between the, these two data sets since uh, about five out of seven fields show a very good agreement between the two data sets. This would imply that the lower velocity components of the SMC in the main body, the uh, H1 filament is uh, indeed following the magnetic fields there. We have further uh, quantified this alignment by performing a KS test with the null hypothesis being that the angle difference is following a uniform distribution from zero to 90 degrees, while the alternative hypothesis is that the angle difference is skewed towards zero, meaning there's an alignment between them. The resulting key value of about 0.025 uh, show that uh, the alignments that we see is indeed statistically uh, significant. To summarize, we have used the new gas cap H1 data to, to study the potential alignments of H1 filaments with magnetic fields in the small Magellanic cloud. We have found agreements in the main body of the SMC for the low velocity components, and this could uh, Actually, this is a pretty surprising result because, as I've uh, said before, uh, the uh, agreements we see in the Milky we see in the Milky Way uh, is dependent on the physical resolution, and from our new gas cap data, the physical resolution is even uh, poorer than the case of the using the gas H1 data. But we still see an alignment there. This would imply that magnetic field is important in the shaping of these H1 structures there, and also it would. Uh, tell us that the lower velocity H1 components is physically closer to us than the higher velocity components. Finally, we do not see a clear agreement in the tidal interaction or the wing region, which could suggest that the H1 structure is there uh, dominated by tidal forces. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Jackie. Um, we have First off, one question on Slack from Alec Thompson. Really cool work, Jackie. Can Gaia parallaxes help to constrain the 3D distribution of the stars? That's a good, very good question. Yeah, if we can get the, um, like the actual physical distance to each of the stars from, let's say, Gaia data, it, it would definitely be very valuable. But Unfortunately, I think the SMC is too far to um, give any distance estimates from Gaia parallax measurements. Do we have other questions online or in the other hubs? I don't think so, but we have another question on Slack from Brent Groves. Jackie, are there background polarized sources that could confirm the high plus low filaments alignment? Uh, do you mean optical background sources to SMC or 
the radio because I think in optical, uh, I have to say I'm not familiar with the optical properties of let's say AGNs, but I would assume they are often intrinsically linearly polarized. And if for such cases, we may not be able to use the polarization of these objects to trace the magnetic fields in the SMC. While for radio, I think if we use the rotation measure measurements, we are measuring the line of sight magnetic fields while we are studying the, uh, the magnetic fields in the plane of the sky here. Okay, uh, and we have another question from uh, Sonia Pankov, sorry for mispronouncing. Do you plan to perform a similar analysis of the LMC? Yeah, I would definitely be interested to extend this to the, SMC, uh, the, the LMC, especially because uh, the LMC uh, is physically a little bit closer to us, which will also give uh, a slightly high angular resolution, which might benefit uh, our study here as well. The key thing we need is for anybody to do starlight polarization measurements, don't we? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll give one last chance for any final questions on the hubs or online. If not, uh, let's thank Jackie and all of our speakers in this session again. Thank you very much and everybody can go and enjoy their afternoon morning teas, whatever. <laughs>